As someone who's successfully founded multiple businesses, I cannot overstate how important it is to have a single source of truth for your business, for inventory, for revenue, and on and on. There's an amazing tool called NetSuite that can help you do just that. Visit netsuite.com slash SPI to download their KPI checklist for free and support this podcast. If you do find yourself buried in manual work or struggling to have a clear picture of your business, you should know three numbers, 37,000, 25, and one. 37,000, that's the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. Number 25, well, NetSuite turns 25 years old this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. And the number one, because your business is one of a kind. So you get a customized solution for all of your KPIs in one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need to grow all in one place. And right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash SPI. That's netsuite.com slash SPI to get your own KPI checklist. netsuite.com slash SPI. There's a better way to create a website, a professional, crisp website you'll be proud to publish, and it just takes seconds. This is all thanks to Hostinger's AI website generator. I recently took this for a test drive, even shared this on my YouTube channel. It was mind-blowing. Not just how quick you can build a website, but with the AI, how great it actually can write copy for you. You can use the AI logo maker, plus it got it up in no time, and it looks good. Absolutely mind-blowing. So if you want to build a website, go to Hostinger, because they're a top, highly-rated global web hosting platform. And all you have to do to build a website is just answer three questions and let the AI do all the work for you. You can build as many web pages as you need without knowing how to code a single line of anything. They have great support, too. That was one thing that I had a problem with with, a, with a, another host back in the day. Hostinger has 24-7 support and a library of video guides. And here's the thing. You can do this for less than $3 a month, including a free domain name. That is crazy. So create a live website now at hostinger.com slash SPI. And listeners of this podcast, you can enter SPI for 10% off your order and a free domain name, H-O-S-T-I-N-G-E-R.com slash SPI and use the code SPI for 10% off and a free domain name. Give it a spin. This is the Smart Passive Income Podcast with Pat Flynn, session number 200. What, what? Welcome to the Smart Passive Income Podcast, where it's all about working hard now, so you can sit back and reap the benefits later. And now your host, he can sing songs from Frozen with the best of them, Pat Flynn. Job searches can feel like they're taking forever, a real slog, so stop searching and just match with Indeed. So ditch the busy work, use Indeed for scheduling, screening, messaging, so you can connect with candidates faster. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences, so the more you use Indeed, the better it gets. If you want to hire fast, you need to go where the talent is. You can get unparalleled access to job seekers with over 350 million unique visitors globally, according to Indeed data, and an extended reach through Glassdoor. I love how adaptable Indeed is uh, as well, whether you're hiring one person or you need lots for a scalable project, like hiring platform that lets you schedule and interview hundreds of candidates in one day, like there's no other one that you would wanna use. So join more than three and a half million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at indeed.com slash smart passive. Just go to indeed.com slash smart passive right now and support our show by saying you heard about Indeed on this podcast. Indeed.com slash smart passive. Terms and conditions apply. You need to hire, you need Indeed. If you're at a desk a lot like I am, it is really important to move around and increase circulation as much as possible. And a sit slash stand desk can be a massive game changer. If you haven't tried one before, this offer from Uplift is for you. Plus you can support the show at the same time. Visit upliftdesk.com slash SPI for 5% off your order. Uplift Desk is the place to go. There are so many customization options, plus free 30 day returns, free shipping, free accessories with every desk. And did I mention the industry-leading 15-year warranty? It's no wonder they've been wire cutters pick for six years in a row. Plus, they offer a great range of ergonomic chairs and storage systems if you want to give your whole workspace a makeover. They even have an augmented reality feature so you can see what your new desk will look like in your space using your phone. I mean, they even make a height-adjustable conference table that doubles as a regulation-sized ping-pong table. These folks have really thought of it all. And if you want to build the workstation of your dreams, I highly recommend checking them out. Just go to upliftdesk.com slash SPI for 5% off your order. 
That's uplift.com slash SPI to get 5% off your entire order. What's up, everybody? Thank you so much for joining me today. In this episode, 200 episodes since July 2010. It's incredible. And to think that we have surpassed 20 million downloads. So 20 million downloads over the course of 200 episodes, like this is incredible. And I wanna thank you guys so much, whether this is your first episode you're listening to or you've listened to all of them or anything in between, I just wanna thank you so much because this show wouldn't exist without you. Obviously, I absolutely just love to death what I do, but I love it even more knowing that you're there on the other end and you're listening and thank you for all the shout outs and the thanks and the letters and the emails and just everything that you guys do for me. Uh, I am here for you and especially now that we're in 2016, now that my book is out, I'm just so stoked and thankful for all of you. So I'm not gonna talk about my book today. Um, if you do wanna check it out, go to willitflybook.com, but this is about this episode and what, Todd Trester has to bring to the table. Yes, it's episode 200, and I didn't wanna make a huge deal of it. I think episode 300 will be a big deal where I'll do some like Sparta, sort of like a announcement or something, but this is episode 200, and we're gonna get right into the content. Todd is a fellow mastermind member with me and Jamie Tardy and Roderick Russell and Josh Shipp, and we all talk every single Monday, but I love Todd uh, for several different reasons, but I loved him even more after I watched him present about this exact content that we're talking about today. I invited him to, to talk about the exact same thing he talked about at FinCon last year, the Financial Blogger Conference, and it blew everybody's mind. I actually, I actually periscoped this, and I had over 800 people catch that live and just say nothing but positive things. And if you read the title of this particular podcast episode, you know you might be surprised, and it is actually counterintuitive, how Todd deleted a third of his content and tripled his traffic. Now, why would you even delete content in the first place? Isn't it supposed to be evergreen and all this stuff? And you know, this is actually a trend that, that's happening, this sort of content audit. I'm actually in the middle of it right now because come next month or the month after, you're gonna see the brand new, excuse me, Smart Passive Income design, which is gonna blow your minds. It's already blown mine. I'm working with a great team and um, we are doing some stuff that I've never seen on any websites before. But one of the things we're doing also is the content on it. We're actually deleting stuff, we're changing older content. And the way that Todd explains this, he actually walks you through step-by-step step how to do this. It's, it's, it's amazing. And like, in, like I said in the beginning, it doesn't sound like it would work, but once you understand the principles behind it, it makes sense that it completely works. So without further ado, let's welcome Todd Tresseter from financialmentor.com. Here he is. What's up everybody, Pat here with my good friend and fellow mastermind group member, Todd Tresseter from financialmentor.com. Todd, welcome to the SPI podcast. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me on the show, Pat. So this is, you know, we've been friends for a long time. We've been in a mastermind group together and I've never really seen you speak before. So when I got the chance to watch you speak at FinCon this past year, uh, I got really excited. So I was sitting there and your content blew me and also everybody else in that room away, which is why I wanted you to come on the show. And I even filmed that on Periscope and everybody on Periscope was like, you need to have this guy on your show because his content is exactly what we all need to hear. So I'm excited for you to share what it is you're gonna talk about. So what is it that, we're gonna be talking about today, Todd. Uh, I stumbled into something a couple years back only because my site was such a ridiculous mess. I did what you know we'll call a content audit and we'll kind of reframe that in a second here as we start talking. And it turned out that I, it, because of that, it put me on the leading edge of something the big brands are all doing now. And so what I did in my presentation was called How I Tripled My Traffic by Deleting a Third of My Content. It's a great title by the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, as we, as we know, as content marketers and as writers, right, the title's everything. Yeah. But how you tripled your traffic by deleting a third of your content. So literally you deleted content that you had already published on your website. And I think the first question people are going to ask themselves is, or ask you is why in the world would you want to delete content that you've spent so many hours putting into the, your website? Uh, what, why would you even consider doing that? Because uh, it's off-brand, irrelevant, poor quality. Um, you know, quality is the new SEO, right? I mean, Google's come a long, long, long ways. And, you know, in the old days, in the days of long-tail keywords and all that, you could just publish a bunch of stuff. You could put out 250, 500-word blog posts, and you'd capture some long-tail keywords, and there's old SEO tra tricks and all this old stuff. Well, Google's come a long ways, and... Um, you want to create a high quality experience, both for from Google for ranking, 
because they clearly they want the best quality experience for their for their users mm -hmm. as well as for your users. You want to create the best quality experience for your users. And you do that no different than you would by editing an article or editing a post. You got to edit your site. And that's why I call it it's not necessarily a content audit, it's a content edit. And I like the analogy you used in the presentation where you talk about your website is almost like a book essentially because it's made up of all these different pieces of content but you would never publish the first draft of a book yeah yeah so that's the analogy i tried to draw since you know who i was presenting to was all content marketers in the financial space and and writers and i was trying to draw an analogy it would make sense because people are really intimidated by the idea of an audit you know we think of an irs audit or mm -hmm. you know anything like that it sounds like a lot of work and it's going to be cumbersome and it is but um, edit makes a lot more sense to people when they hear it because, uh, you know, it, a post, you would never just publish a first draft of a post, right, Pat? No, you go through it, you edit it, you read it out loud to fix mistakes and maybe through doing that you add more points or stories or take them out. Yeah, and so now you're writing a book and it's kind of the same thing times 10, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so, you know, you do a rough draft of a book, you start at one point, you draft it out, you get your ideas down. And you go back through it and you think, oh, this is terrible, right? And so then you come up with some more concepts. You rework the whole book. You start getting excited about it. Then it goes to a formal edit, you know, where somebody does content edit. And then it goes through a couple more. And then it goes through line edits and on and on and on. And that's what creates a great reading experience for the buyer. And it's the same thing with your website. If you think about your website, you started on day one and you started publishing content. And then you've published it in chronologic, chronological order. That's what a blog does. And so over time, you've built this uh, conglomeration, if you will, of content on the site. And it's been built piece by piece by piece, no different than you would write pages in a book. And so a content edit is the same thing or a content audit is the same thing as in a book where you go back, you reorganize, you delete the old stuff that's out of date, you tighten it up, you kill your darlings, according to Stephen King. Mm -hmm. You know, you just go through the whole thing and really tighten up so it creates a great reader experience. And it just happens that Google can detect that. They can detect the quality of the site, the tightness of the site, the focus of the site. And as a result, they reward that. When I thought about this initially, I was like, really? Like this, this doesn't make sense. But then I thought about it more. And actually from a user's perspective, it's like, you know, I, I had or have, because I'm actually doing this content audit uh, slash edit right now, my team as we are coming up for a new redesign, we, we are going back into our old content. We're deleting content. We're doing some redirects. And we'll talk about some of the strategies uh, in terms of the audit in just a sec. Uh -huh. But, you know, I, you know, some of those old posts are totally irrelevant. Some of them are, are very much based off of just stuff that was happening that week. And that's it. And so if for whatever reason people landed on that particular page, they would immediately leave. And that means the time on the site is less. The bounce rate is high which is all an indication to Google that this is not a site that they should be on. Exactly. And there's even more reasons why it works. I mean, yeah, it sounds a little hokey at first, right? Delete your content, your traffic goes up. But there's a lot of other reasons why it works too. For example, another one is that you're consolidating your link juice, right? So if you're deleting content, but then you're redirecting it, 301 redirecting it to other related content, key point there, re related relevant content, then you're consolidating all that link juice, all that social media juice into fewer but, but better posts. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's a lot of reasons why it works. Um, but yeah, it's counterintuitive at first to think getting rid of stuff actually increases the value of your site, but it does. And you said you kind of accidentally stumbled upon this. Yeah. So what happened, you know this, Pat, from our being together for, for years in the mastermind is – I've had you know, a lot of different business plans, and as I go into develop them, I kept running into what I'd call yeah buts. You know, every time I was going to do something, because my site was such a mess, you know, I had, if, I, if I'm going to go implement this plan, then I go, yeah, but I need to get this done first. Yeah, but I need to fix this. Yeah, but I got to get this all worked out. And I finally just kind of threw up my hands at one point and got sick of my yeah buts and said, you know, I just need to get this foundation correct. And I think you remember at the beginning of the mastermind year last year where we set our goals, I set the goal of just getting this thing cleaned out and, and getting that foundation set for all the business plans I have going forward. And so I just dug into it with fury and started, you know, went through what we'll teach today. And lo and behold, I had no idea it was going to result in increased traffic because, again, I was kind of on the leading edge of this. I fell into it by accident. 
and uh, and it worked. You know, once I did all this, and suddenly my traffic jumped. I went, "Whoa, where'd that come from?" And just in recent times, now a lot of the bigger brands are getting into this. You know, major brands, and we can talk about it. And they're showing similar statistics. So it's not just me. A lot of people are having the same experience. What other brands and people are experiencing this or doing these audits too? Okay, well, HubSpot's been doing uh, republishing and and content content consolidation. And they've documented a 106% increase in traffic wow. on the on those posts. And they've more than doubled the leads coming from them. Uh, Moz.com showed some studies on their site where they both increased traffic and they 8x, you know, eight times their lead generation. Um, some names that people may not be as familiar with, like there's another site in the financial space that I'm friends with, uh, Robert Farrington over at the collegeinvestor.com. Um, he purged about 30% of his posts and documented a jump in traffic. I had a client, coaching client from, from my business, uh, Tulane Medaner. Uh, her site is lifecoach.com. And she had a similar pile of yeah buts and site problems because obviously to have a URL called lifecoach.com, you've been in the business for a while. Yeah, yeah. And, and so she had a kind of a hodgepodge of site platforms and content spread here and there. And we went through a massive content audit process and uh, she reduced her total articles by about 50%. And in the first two months, she doubled her traffic. Wow, that's insane. There's even a sound to go along with how awesome that is. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, computer went off in the background. Yeah, sorry about that. No, it's funny. Uh, man, that, that, that's... <laughs> I mean, so this works, but like how does one go about... I mean, this is a huge task. You, I mean, it's easy yeah. just to just say, this works, go do a content on it. I mean, that's obviously much harder than it is said. So how does... Like, is there a step-by-step -step process by which somebody could do a content audit? on their own website. Yeah, there is. Let me give you the 30,000 foot overview and then we'll dig into it chunk by chunk. Okay. Cause like, like we said, it is a, a big task. So first let's understand how we map it out and then we'll go through the actual steps of implementation. Does that sound all right? Let's do it. Huh? All right. All right. So 30,000, 30,000 foot overview is what you're going to do is you're going to go to through your entire archive of content from your oldest stuff to your newest stuff. So everything, every page, every post, um, what I did was I had my tech guy literally send me a database dump. And if you've ever seen a WordPress database dump, they come out as numbers. Mm -hmm. Like it doesn't even have the URLs in it. But anyway, the nice thing about doing a database dump, if you can get somebody to do it for you, is that it misses nothing. All right. Because if it's in the database, it'll be in the dump. And what you do is you go through and you uh, check off each one and you categorize it according to one of four different categories. The first one is keep. Right, So you keep the post as is and you do that because it's really high quality evergreen content and it reinforces your brand. So that'd be the first one is keep. The second category is improve. So what you're doing is you're categorizing everything, right? Mm -hmm. The second category is improve. And that's something that's good. It's on brand, but it needs some updating, needs some expanding. It needs to be improved. The third category is consolidate. And consolidation is reserved for... Um, You'll probably remember this, Pat, in the old days in blogging, like you didn't do this and I didn't do this, but a lot of people did. There was kind of this belief that you should have 250 to 500 word posts. Mm -hmm. You know, you and I both kind of been long content guys. Um, but anyway, if you have a lot of short content that's in a similar subject matter, then you can consolidate it into a single pillar post. And so that would be another category you would mark your stuff off as, as consolidate. And then the final one is remove. And that's because it's off-brand or irrelevant. Yes. And the, the hard one is the consolidate one, I think. And also the remove one, obviously, because it's like, that's my baby. I worked so many hours in, on that. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's again, you published a first draft from the moment you started your blog to the moment where you're at now. Now is the time to start cutting out the, the weeds, I guess you could say. Um, the, the consolidation part uh, is, is interesting because, yeah, I, I, I never did any of the short-term stuff or the short-form content, um, but I have read studies about the uh, parallel between more words and better engagement, more words and better, uh, you know, just time more time on site for obvious reasons. And, and, and it's hard because a lot of people always ask me, you know, Pat, how many words should my blog post be? And my answer is always, well, as long as it needs to be to get convey the content in the way that you can do that uh, and get your audience to take action. Uh, but the longer it seems, it, it, the better. And so that's why I think the consolidation part is hard, but also is, is very important too. 
Yeah, there's no question this is hard, right? Because you're killing your darlings. You know, you've put work into this stuff and it's, you know, some of it gets some traffic and it's hard to wrap your head around it first. Once you've done it, it's a no-brainer, right? Like once you've gone through and you've deleted the stuff, you've done the 301 redirects, you've consolidated the, the small posts into killer, killer posts, you know, it's so obvious that the site provides an improved user experience and then, you know, go, uh, assuming Google rewards it for you too like they did for me, um, you know, the whole response is so clear. It, it's, it's easy once you get it, but when you're actually doing it and you're deleting your content and you're consolidating content and stuff, it's really hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, like I said, I'm in the middle of this right now and it is hard, but I'm also very excited to share the results. And at the moment that we are recording this, I have, uh, you know, I'm still on the old site and when the new one comes about, it's going to include this audit. And so I don't know when this podcast episode is going to go live, Todd, but if it, co if it goes live after and I have some time to kind of gather some results, uh, I might follow up and put the second half to this. Um, or maybe even do that if we publish it sooner and I'll come back and add more later or at least an update in the uh, show notes on what has happened since. So just look out for that, everybody. It's coming if it hasn't already. I will share the results of the upcoming uh, or previous, I guess you could say, if you're listening to this in the future, content audit using a lot of these strategies. And we did do the same thing. We did a content dump. We ranked and categorized uh, the the posts uh, in, in that same way. We also used that opportunity to recategorize the posts um, in terms of blog blog categories and tags and, and all those sorts of things too. You know, we're doing a big overhaul and it, it is a lot of work. I've had, I'm lucky enough to have some other people do it for me. All right. Well, you know what we should do, Pat, right? Where you, cause you just, you just kind of uh, started something, which is what is the criteria by which you uh, decide this, right? And so maybe it'd be good if we gave the listeners a uh, kind of a list of deadly sins, a checklist of deadly sins so they can kind of think about, okay, what are they looking for when they go through this? Okay. Yeah. Let's do it. That All sounds right. great. So a couple of the things are things like um, old articles that are no longer relevant to your brand, okay? So, or possibly you've clarified and narrowed the focus of your writing, and so the writing has to get reworked so it's on brand. But it's, you know, it's still good stuff. You could have old sponsored posts that need to be deleted. You could have old content that's good stuff, but it just needs to be updated. It's out of date. You could have multiple small posts that need to be combined into a single pillar post. You could have some of your best stuff that was written years ago and it's buried in like a date order, uh, date order hierarchy, mm -hmm. you know, inside the blog. Uh, you could have content in the wrong location. That was the thing that got me going. You were just saying how you had content in the wrong location. Um, I had the same problem. I had a, some of my best stuff was all in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. I had it in pages instead of posts. You know, you might have menus that are a jumbled mess because you've been adding stuff and changing stuff over time. Uh, inadequate internal linking on your old posts because they don't link to your newer stuff because obviously it didn't exist back then. Um, your database can be cluttered with a bunch of old stuff that just needs to be cleared out so it's slowing your site down. Um, I mean, do you want me to keep going or? Yes, make, keep going with the list. This is okay. Uh, some people are right. probably like, yep, yep, that's me. That's me. That's yeah, me. yeah. Just be <laughs> checking it off. Like, that's me. And you, they can come back and listen to it and, and slow and just kind of get this checklist. Um, it could be old content that's not structured properly, you know, like with H1s, H2s, mm -hmm. you know, short paragraphs, bullet points, stuff so your, your content's scan friendly. Another one that I had was I had a lot of old content without Pinterest friendly images, right? Like Pinterest or, stuff. Yeah, so Pinterest stuff because it didn't exist back then, you know, or images that didn't have the alt tag and the title tag in them, you know, because I didn't know the SEO stuff back then, or maybe I had inconsistent SEO. Another thing that you see a lot on his sites in, in sites is inconsistent uh, image designs, right? Because they had one VA doing some and then they designed some. And then, you know, so there's not a consistent branding. And what happens is when you look at your category pages and you see all these different images from different generations of designers, it just, it's not professional. Mm -hmm. um, so that's another thing is inconsistent image designs. Another one that's really new right now is inconsistent social media conventions, with your images. So, you know, if, if somebody's pinning a Pinterest image, make sure they get the Pinterest friendly image. And if they're going to Facebook, they need one that uh, matches the specs and same thing for Twitter. And so all that can be done within your site, but that all has to be um, coded in properly. You could have dead links. How long has it been since, you know, you searched the site for dead links and they have to be cleaned out off brand articles. And another one I had a lot of, I had a lot of old inline HTML formatting. And it was before I became savvy using short codes and CSS. Mm -hmm. 
So these are just a lot of different things you can consider as you're going through of stuff you want to look for to clear out and clean out and errors and problems in your site that um, are causing a bad user experience. Okay, so from this point forward, we've categorized all these things. We've gotten the criteria, obviously. There's keep, there's improve, there's consolidate, and there's remove. Um, yeah. Which one do we do first? Or like, if there's a, is there an order of operations here? Yeah, there's an order of implementation, but it's backward from the order of thinking about it. So let's start from the top of the list, and then when you implement, you go from the bottom of the list up to the top. So delete okay. first. Yeah, yeah, when you implement. But let's start with keep and improve as we discuss it, okay? Okay, cool. All right, so keep and improve. The reason I combine those is because they're essentially the same process, and they're very similar. It's just kind of the degree to which you're working on it. But both of them are kept, essentially. So that's the, the key point is both those articles are kept, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so the keep criteria is that, you know, the content is still valid and it's relevant for your brand. And the, the article is reasonably optimized for your focus keyword, so you're not having to rewrite it for SEO. Um, it's complete as is, so it fully covers the topic. You don't have to expand on it. And it gets decent traffic in social media, right? It's a good asset for your site. Now, if you contrast that with improve, improve is pretty similar, but the difference is improve is going to require more work on your part. So an improve article, you're still keeping it per se, but it's off brand, right? You're going to have to rework it a little bit. Or maybe it's a really good topic for your site, but it's bad quality. You know, you wrote it years ago. You weren't the writer you are today. Mm-hmm. Or maybe maybe your focus of your site's changed a little. And then the other one, too, is it could be like a review post that needs updating. A lot of people have review posts if they're affiliates. So that would be an improve article. And so when you have a keep and improve, the, the key point is your – you're keeping it, but now you have to go through and clean it up and rework it because even the keep and improves get reworked. And so your action step checklist is you start, you, you've got to edit it with new info, right? And then another thing that came up a lot, like with Clay Collins with lead pages in your, in your interview with Clay, you know, he talked about you can put in a lead magnet, you know, an opt-in magnet that's specific to that article when you do that. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm gosh, I, uh, that's a great point. I just came out with a couple lead magnets recently, emailthesmartway.com and also affiliatemarketingthesmartway.com. And I have a whole batch of articles that were written a long time ago on those topics. So you're saying I could go back or I should go back. And now that I'm saying this, I will go back <laughs> uh, and include those, those links or those opt-in forms to get those lead magnets on those older articles. Exactly. So that's kind of a bonus thing. You don't have to do that. But if if your primary goal is email opt-in conversion, which yours is and yeah, mine that's, is. That's going to be huge. Yeah, then that's a huge thing to do, right? Because you're going to dramatically improve your conversion rates. And so, you know, go in and edit it, possibly create a lead magnet for that, for that article. Um, focus on the quality, you know, is it current? Is it relevant? What needs to be rewritten? Look at the headlines, you know, typical article writing stuff. Look at the headlines. Look at the opening paragraph. Is it grabby? Does it pull you through? Look at the images according to the checklist I just went through. You know, does it have the proper uh, SEO, the proper feature image? Is everything in place? Mm -hmm. You know, make sure you've got that Pinterest friendly image so it's really easy for people to pin. Um, You know, look at your formatting, right? What I went through earlier about the formatting, the H1, H2, subhead, scan friendly. Make sure you got all that. Look for duplicate content on your site. Is there duplicate content where you really should combine them rather than just keep or improve? Maybe it really should be a combine. You know, update any affiliate links. Check it for dead links. And then another one you can do is you can update your tags. I don't know about you, but when I started blogging, I had no clue what how tags worked. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, to me it was just a glorified category. Like I, I really didn't understand it, so I ended up with this massive tag clutter in my site. And so when I went through my keep and improve stage, I've been clearing out a lot of the tag clutter as well and just getting a much more focused tag grouping. Another thing you can do is update your internal linking, particularly for your old posts, looking forward to newer stuff that may not be linked up. And then make sure you've got the Yoast SEO plugin green light if you're using that. I don't know if you want to jump in here with the Yoast SEO plugin and talk about that for a second. I mean, we could. What do you have to say about it? Well, just, you know, it's kind of the industry standard plugin and it makes SEO pretty much a no brainer and it's free. And Mm -hmm. so if you're not using it, I mean, you know, I felt funny recommending something on your podcast, but um, I think it's kind of the industry standard. I don't know if you agree. No, I agree. Okay. And another one you can do if you're going to republish it, and we'll go into republish versus 301 redirects and all that, but you can delete the old comments at that point. 
so that it looks fresh and the dating's up to date on it. They don't see a bunch of old comments. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's about it. So that would be kind of your action steps for on the keep and improve. Quick question before we move on to the next one. Sure. How long do you feel a blog should be up before it could go through this process? Like, Great question. Yeah, I think it's relevant at a couple years. Mm-hmm. You know, you're going to, it depends on your blog frequency, you know, how, how frequently you write articles and how many you've got in the site and how much change you've been through. Um, for me, I was way overdue, right? Because right. I just had As so many mistakes and so much learning. You know, you're saying you're overdue. Because you could get too much on this. You could do this every week if you wanted to and kind of just clean things up. Obviously, well, that's too much. But Okay, so that's a great point. What happens is once you've been through it, you're going to keep your site fairly clean going forward because for me anyway, it's completely changed how I manage my site. You've gone through like a cleanse, like a juice cleanse with your site. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So like I permanently changed my diet based on the (laughs) cleanse diet. Right. Yeah. You know, and so I've, I've permanently changed my content diet as well. Like I don't put anything up on my site that isn't evergreen, that's on brand, that isn't extremely high quality, that doesn't completely kill the category or the topic that I'm trying to uh, talk about. You know, so to, to me, it's changed how I publish and how I manage my content. So, yes, I will. The one thing that I have also learned through this is the strategy of republishing. And, you know, if you want to, we can go into that or we can stay on track and do the consolidate and delete and then come back. Well, to republishing, it. this is taking an older, older article and writing a completely brand new article that's essentially the same thing or actually just changing the data on that. Yeah. So republishing, I learned from peers because I hadn't been doing it, but I think it's a really powerful strategy. That's the one that you're seeing HubSpot do a lot. And you're seeing a uh, copy blogger media also do a lot right now is they'll take old posts, they update them, they bring in new images, they change stuff around and they republish on the same URL. Now you can only do that if you don't have dates in your URLs. It's the same URL. Yeah. So you're keeping the same URL, but what it does is it moves it up in the feed and it sends it out to all your subscribers, right? And so what happens is if you have stuff that's three years old, none of your subscribers are going to remember it. And if you bring it up and make it current and republish it, now what happens is you're double downing on all the link juice and social media juice, right? Because it's already a powerful article, but now it goes out to everybody. Everybody links to it. Everybody talks about it. It gets a lot of activity again. And suddenly that article climbs in the rankings. And uh, there's several reasons why it's effective. It's also um, now it's got a fresh date on it. And I don't know about you, but when I'm searching in the in Google and I look at different dates when I'm deciding what I'm going to click on. And so when oh, you have yeah. a fresher date, you get a higher click through rate. That makes sense. So yeah, technically, without getting too technical, how would one go about publishing an article in this with fresh with the same URL. If I were to, for example, create a new blog post, copy and paste that article into that blog post, change it up a little bit, add new images, maybe the same title, maybe not, but have the same URL, would it tell me, sorry, this slug's already taken, or would it be okay to just kind of replace that other one that was already there? Well, in WordPress, you just change the date on it. In other words, there's a date listed for publishing. And so when you change the date and then. Uh, okay. It, so it, you go back into that older one, redo that one, just update the date. Yeah, exactly. And I'm still learning on this pet. This is the one thing I'm not an expert on. As I said, this one got, um, I got turned on to this by my peers as I was, you know, developing this presentation. Yeah. And I was going through the whole process. This is super so, interesting though. Cause it's like, yeah. you wouldn't so think I've only republished that. one post. This would probably be a great thing for people to chime in in the comments and uh, add to this uh, because I've only republished one post. It did move up in the RSS feed, but my email provider did not send it out to all my subscribers. So for some reason, they didn't treat it as news. So I'm missing one piece as to how I make it so it's news, so it goes out to all my subscribers. Because you auto, you have it automated. Yeah, it's okay. an automated process, so it's blogged to broadcast over at AWeb. Or, okay, cool. And, and they didn't pick up on it. But I've seen you know Copy Blogger, and I've seen uh, HubSpot, sending them out and republishing old content and it does go out to the subscribers. So um, I'm missing one little chunk of that piece. So hopefully your your subscribers can comment on it and bring us up to date. Yeah, I mean, the one thing about that, I, did, I, I haven't gone back into older posts and then changed the date on them. And you had mentioned earlier to kind of wipe out the comments and just start fresh, essentially. 
Uh, yeah. But I have republished content that is essentially the same material in a new blog post. I recently did this actually with my affiliate marketing stuff. And I mean, the one concern I think a lot of people might have is, oh, well, people already read that. And, you know, aren't, aren't they getting the same thing twice? And I have not had one person complain about that. Actually, I've had people say, oh, I remember when you talked about this a while ago. Thank you for bringing it back and actually updating it. Well, I haven't even heard that. I mean, I've actually had people take some some of my most popular posts that, and longtime subscribers and turn around and say, "Wow, that was an amazing article!" Like it was never they've never seen it before. Right? Like they would ne- they didn't even know it's something you previously previously published. Yeah, yeah. And so this is an example of things you learn by going through the content audit strategy. Is that what I've learned is I'm going to make republishing part of my ongoing content strategy that I'm going to be constantly updating, like I'm going to create an update schedule for my content, bring stuff up to date, rewrite it, keep the whole site current that way. Plus it takes writing pressure off of me. Cause you know, here's the thing that people need to realize is that, you know, there's a, there's like a content explosion out there. There's way more content than anybody can, can consume. Like take your site as an example. It would take what a year or two to read your whole site. I mean, you've got massive piles of content. Over a thousand. Yeah, yeah. So over a thousand posts and pages? Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. And, and so, you know, it take readers a long time to get through that. So what you want is you want it focused on just the best stuff so the reader has an amazing experience when they're there. Yeah, I mean, that's why I created my best of page and also my getting started page. So as not to confuse those people, but Google still sees all of it and people do find their way into those older things that don't matter at some point. So yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Okay, so... You know, we've talked about a lot already, but we still have a few pieces of the puzzle remaining. Let's talk about consolidation and deletion and kind of the implement implementation strategies for those. Yeah, these are relatively simple compared to the earlier two. So consolidation is just where you have a bunch of short posts and you look at them and say, you know, this is really one topic. Let's combine them and make a, a pillar post. You know, let's make something that really kills that category and really, you know, knocks it out of the park. And then what you do is you place that pillar post on the most active, you know, the, the one that gets the most traffic and the most uh, social media attention is where you place that pillar post and then you 301 redirect all the deleted posts up to that one pillar post location. Now, 301 redirect, I know what that is. I've done that. That's what saved me when I got a, uh, when I got a nice little letter from the United States Green Building Council having me redirect or actually change my domain name from in the lead.com to greenexamacademy.com. So I know what a 301 redirect is, but can you explain really quick for people who might not know what that is, what it is? Yeah, so 301 redirect is just, it. it's a redirect that says the content that used to exist here now exists over here. And, and so it's, it's providing the new URL where Google should look to right. find the new content. It doesn't just redirect the user. They will be redirected to that uh, site that you say or that URL that you established as the one that people should look at, but it also redirects Google too, which is the obviously the, an, a, a big component of it too, so that you keep all the link juice and everything goes and flows into that, that one article. Yeah, and there's some questions on 301 redirects for implementation that came up in the presentation, uh, so we should probably address that, which was, you know, how do you do it? And so it depends on your platform. In, in some things like apparently in Yoast SEO, they have 301 redirect built right in on the paid version where you can do it. I know for where I have my site hosted, it's on an NGINX server, which is beyond my pay grade to explain. But basically, because of how it's configured, they want it done at the server level. And so I have to provide them with pre-formatted text files of all my 301 redirects. They load them into the, at the server level. And apparently, that's like the fastest, most efficient way to do it. But again, this is going to depend on your configuration. So you're going to have to, you know, you're going to have to figure out how it's done for your specific site and how it's configured and what software you're using. Right. right, right. And But there's a fun story I should tell on the 301 redirect, Pat, about how I did a 301 redirect for mine. Um, you know, I deleted probably 150 posts in a day and then sent to the hosting company, you know, the 301 redirect file all in one day. And the very next day I vanished from the search engines. Like it was mind blowing. I, I thought I was gone. I thought I'd totally blown it. Um, terms that I was on page one for, for a decade, literally a decade, I was suddenly on page 12. 
you know, terms that I was on page four for, I had vanished, you know, because I track certain key terms. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's kind of scary. <laughs> well, I was freaked. I mean, I was absolutely <laughs> freaked because, you know, I was really coming from a good place, right? I'm trying to create a great user experience. I'm trying to do the right thing here. And I thought, oh, gosh, maybe I really blew it here um, doing a big batch file, these 301 redirects. It was amazing. It le- exactly a week to the day later, my site reappeared in the search engine stronger than ever. Like, if I was middle of page one, I went near the top, like top three. If I was in top three, I was back there. If I was on page two, I was on page one. If I was on page five, I was on page two. Like, I mean, huge jump within a week. And so I'm guessing I triggered a manual review of some sort and they looked at it. Because the, the key thing is on a 301 redirect, the key criteria for doing it right is you've got to send it to highly relevant content. So in other words, you don't want to be 301 redirecting to your homepage as an example. The key when you do a 301 redirect is it's got to be, you know, an equivalent piece of content, a proper equivalent. So when a user is clicking on something and they go to it, they feel like they found the right thing. Right. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's a 301 redirect and that's what you do when you have relevant content. And for me and probably for you, there's there's hardly a piece of content on your site that doesn't have a relevant equivalent. So for somebody that's been do- at this game for a while, they should be doing mostly, if not all, 301 redirects. I did not do anything that did not have a 301 redirect. Um, but there are two other forms. There's a 410 and a 404. And so a 410 is an actual delete, right? That means that there's no equivalent whatsoever. You truly deleted it. And the good thing about doing a 410 is it really sig- signals Google that this piece of content's gone and they get it removed fairly quickly. You want a you want a quick and easy way to see what a 410 looks like? Sure. You go to in the lead.com, which was my original URL. For, it is gone. For cuz it, it literally says gone, the requested resource is no longer available, blah blah blah, 410 gone error was encountered while trying to use an error document to handle the request. And the reason this is not a redirect even though I was asked to not use my URL anymore, I was in the first pass of trying to resolve that, I did a 301 redirect. And they came back a few weeks later and said, oh, no, we, we told you you couldn't use it, and that includes redirects. But luckily, I had done the 301 for enough time that all that link juice had passed through into greenexamacademy.com, and then at that point, that 410 error was placed onto indelete.com, and that's still been there for the last, that's been there for the last, I don't know, seven years now. Yeah. Yeah, and so that's signifying to Google, it's truly gone. You know, that the content doesn't exist somewhere else. So 301 tells Google the content exists somewhere else. That's why it has to be highly relevant. Whereas a 410 says it's gone, right? And so that tells them to remove it from the search engines. A 404 is just the content isn't found, right? And so in my opinion, that's just sloppy web management, right? Because you're giving a lousy user experience by sending people to a 404 page. And so really you should be looking at primarily 301s and 410s. Sometimes the 404 is not your fault, though. Correct. Because somebody else who may be linking to you might be linking to uh, to you with the, the wrong URL, or maybe there's a misspelling or or, or something. Um, so there there are things, and we won't get we don't have to get into the uh, hardcore strategies because I think that I've I've written on 404 pages before. You want to make that experience. You don't want people to end up there, but if they do, you still want that experience to be great in terms of. You don't just say, hey, guys, sorry. You can say, hey, you know, what you were looking for wasn't here, but maybe this is what you were looking for, or here's how you can find that information. So those are just some things to keep in mind in terms of a 404. Yeah, like on mine, a 404, I have some fun little opening line in the headline like, oops, you know, we have a boo-boo here, error, <laughs> or something. And then it offers um, uh, the four main categories. You know, if you're interested in these, click here, and it'll give you a directory of my best stuff. And then, you know, or maybe you want to start here. Maybe, you know, you want to start here and it takes them to my start here page. So I just try to give them a couple logical choices to, again, improve the user experience. Ah, okay, cool. Yeah, so anyway, those are the 301, 410, and 404s um, of how, what you're doing when you're deleting content, which takes us, so we were talking about consolidate when we got into that, and that takes us to deleting, right? So why would you delete content? And the reason is because it's out of date, it could be irrelevant, it could be off-brand, it could be really low quality, or maybe it's just, you know, it's not getting any traffic or attention, and so why have it there? Uh, It could be a short post that you repurposed in the consolidation strategy we earlier talked about. 
It could be old sponsored posts that you don't want to keep around anymore. I mean, you know, there's a lot of reasons why you would get rid of it. A lot of people also had old roundup posts. You know, you don't see them as often, but there used to be a lot of old roundup carnivals. Posts. Yeah, yeah, blog carnivals and <laughs> You know, there's a lot of stuff that just shouldn't be on your site anymore. And so uh, those are all things that you can just delete. And then then you, you just go continue on in your merry way after that, right? Yeah. So I think the relevant question here is, well, how do you do all that, right? Like, how do you actually go through this process and put it together? Do you want to cover that now? Yeah, I guess because we've covered a lot and we've covered even the individual pieces. But how do we put it all together? Yeah, so the starting point, as I said earlier, is you get a database dump from your tech guy. If that's kind of beyond your pay grade and you don't have somebody that can do it for you, you know, you can go into Webmaster Tools and they have a fairly comprehensive but you list of your posts and pages. It might be a little bit off. You could try Google Analytics. So there's different tools you can go to um, that will give you a pretty good list or you can go to your um, – your H- oh, I'm trying to think of the, the file that the bots go to. HTA access? Yeah, it's not the HTA access. It's the one that is actually what the search engines go into that lists every post and page on the site. <laughs> I don't know. I have anyway, my guy to figure out. <laughs> yeah, so there's another file that you can look at that'll have that stuff. Um, it's it's for the robots. They find it. So anyway, there's other ways to do it, but the best way is get a database dump. Once you get the database dump, you put it in a spreadsheet. Uh, we want to be clear, this is a really complicated process, right? You're dealing with a lot of content and you have to manage it. The only way I know to do it and not lose track of it all is in a spreadsheet. Correct. And, and so what I did was I first, I did the database dump in and then I added, I started adding columns and you know, you just need to add the columns that are relevant for you. So I added the first column was the actual URL because the database dump just gives you a numbered URL. Then I put the title of the post so I could tell what it was. And then I took all of them and rearranged them because the database doesn't or- organize them by categories. So then I structured the whole thing in the spreadsheet so it was all organized by categories so I could make sense of it, right? So it matched how I think of the site being organized, Mm -hmm. right? So then once I got everything moved around and organized, then you just start going through according to that criteria list and deciding. Now, this is where you can go a couple different paths. Uh, If you study content audit online, you'll see that there's a lot of tech, you know, techno babble about it where you can get really complicated with a lot of data I didn't find that was necessary. Um, For me, once I got clear on what my brand is and what it's about and what do I stand for for my site, it was pretty easy to tell what didn't belong there. And so I started with kind of my quality criteria first and then I added columns for how much traffic a site's getting or a page is getting and how much uh, social media attention it's getting. And to me, the quality combined with the traffic and the social media attention Uh, pretty much told me what to keep, what to get rid of, and what to rework. And so I had another column in there where I entered the the keep, improve, consolidate, and delete, and I started doing all that. Mm -hmm. When I did the consolidates, then what I would do is I would patch all the – I would move them in the spreadsheet all together so I could see at a glance what all the articles were that were being consolidated. And then I created another column called notes. So like if I was consolidating them all, I would note which one – was the final recipient that the main new pillar article would get republished on, right? So again, it's going to be different. Everybody's spreadsheet is going to be different. But the idea is that you start with the database dump and then you just start adding columns of information as you go through the process to keep it all organized. And then when you're ready to implement, you start from the bottom up, as I said earlier. So you start with the deletes because it's the single easiest thing to do, right? Mm Mm-hmm. And it has the biggest impact. I mean, my big traffic jump came after the delete and consolidate phase. And so um, you go through and you delete because it's easy. You're going to have a whole column listing deletes. And so you put them together. You do your 301 redirects and bam, it's done. Instantly, your site is much cleaner and tighter. And then you go back through and you do your consolidates, which is the next easiest thing to do, where you're consolidating articles into a single pillar. And so that's fairly quick to do. And then the longer process, which I'm almost done with, I'm 24 articles away from being done as, as we record this, is the keep and improve, where mm-hmm. you go through every piece of content and rework it as necessary according to your checklist so that everything is up to date and your entire site is up to a new higher standard. 
Yeah, and I think by the end of this, or even even just the process of putting that spreadsheet together, you as a byproduct will have this amazing understanding of what has all happened on your website. And you have, like you said, that bird's eye perspective of everything that's going on and you can you can better make decisions moving forward. And I think that's something that I found uh, not bef- not as we were doing the, the content on it, but even before that, when I had Jana come on board and even Mindy to help with Ask Pat, I mean, we ended up creating spreadsheets to keep track of certain components of each of those episodes and each of the pieces of content just for the purposes of, of working together as a team. And by doing that and having those spreadsheets and essentially an archive that's so easy to look at and look back on of everything I've already published and how it's categorized and who's been featured and you know emails related to those guests so that I, we can re- easily reach out to them. It's just, man, it's making life so much easier. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, again, the the thing about this is that it is a lot of work, right? I mean, if you listen to what I just said, it's a lot of work. But where else are you going to get the kind of impact? You know, is it easier to become the next Pinner superstar? Is it easier to publish two, three times as many pillar posts? And even if you did those things, have you really improved the site user experience? You know, I mean, this is kind of, this is giving you a double whammy. You're dramatically improving the user experience at your site and you have a high likelihood of increasing your traffic as well. And it's not just, you're not just pumping new content into your site. You're actually taking s- stuff away. So yeah you're, yeah, you're taking stuff away. And then the other real benefit that came for me out of this is it completely transformed how I view my role as the webmaster and, you know, a content marketer, which is kind of what you were getting towards here. Like, how do I actually run my site going forward so I don't create new messes? Mm-hmm. You know, and that's where I got into like, now I've adopted a republishing strategy. I didn't have that before, but that's going to constantly clean. And that's now part of my ongoing strategy. I didn't have that before I went through this process. Love that. Man, this is going to open up a lot of opportunities for people. And so, uh, Todd, did we miss anything or did we pretty much cover the whole ground? I think. I, th- I think we nailed it, Pat. Yeah, I think you nailed it, Todd. Just, <laughs> <laughs> man, this is, this is, this is awesome. Uh, if anybody has any questions or concerns, you know, I know Todd's deep into this. I'm into it too. And uh, some of you are probably working this or thinking of doing it too. Head on, head on over to the comment section. I'll give the, uh, the URL right after this, um, right, right after I hang up with Todd here. But uh, Todd, thank you so much for your time and for sharing this. And, and I hope uh, this becomes one of those evergreen pieces of content that we can rehash over and over and over again. Because this, this, this is something that's going to be useful now and way into the future too. Yeah, again, it becomes a centerpiece of how you run your site. I mean, I just had to go through the process in order to open my mind to it. But now that I see it, it's just, you know, it's like you'd never publish a book without editing it, right? It, once you see it and once you do it, the whole thing is obvious that this is just a part of how you run your site and how you manage your brand going forward. I love it. I think, we, I think a lot of us needed to hear that. And uh, Todd, thank you for being the one to tell us. All right. Thanks for having me on the show, Pat. Before you go, where can people find out more about you? My site is financialmentor.com. And so what I do, I do advanced retirement planning, advanced investment strategy, how to build wealth, how to become financially independent. Um, so I give away a free ebook, 18 Essential Lessons of a Self-Made Millionaire. And I have a free e-course, 52 Weeks to Financial Freedom. And no, it's not get rich quick, right? It's just what it does in 52 weeks, it gives you a kind of overview and teaches all the principles and all the steps you'll go through. And I give all that away for new subscribers. So love to have people come over. Awesome. Thanks, Todd. We appreciate you and uh, looking forward to uh, sharing the results of this audit if I haven't shared them already. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Hope it comes out good for you. Thanks, man. All right. I hope you enjoyed that episode with Todd Tresseter. Again, you can check him out at financialmentor.com. One of my favorite people in the world. Uh, you know, I lo- he's such a cool guy. I mean, he goes to Burning Man every year with his wife and it's so, I mean, he's just, he's just an awesome, awesome awesome dude. And every time I get to, to hang out with him in person, he's just so fun. But also, he's one of the smartest guys I know too, as you can tell from the content here. So again, if you want to check him out, go to financialmentor.com. If you want to get the show notes and links and resources mentioned in this particular episode, head on over to smartpassiveincome.com slash session 200. Yes, we are in episode 200. Can't believe it. It's been, I don't know, gosh, six years almost. And I just want to thank you guys for all the support over the years, all the reviews and everything. I'm just so thankful that this has turned out the way it did. And you know what? I'm just getting started. Like I said in the beginning, there's gonna be a redesign of the, of the Smart Passive Income blog that you're gonna see in the near future. And uh, man, it's gonna it's gonna be amazing. I also wanna thank a couple sponsors that have helped uh, to put the show together. First of all, 
Freshbooks.com. You got to check them out. They are serving over 3 million small business owners, including myself, with helping us manage our finances, our books, with money coming in, money going out, and also invoicing. If you have any students or you do any consulting or, or coaching, you, you need to bill your people, right, to get paid. And FreshBooks makes it super easy and professional to do it. And so you can get paid faster and continue doing what you need to do. They are an amazing company. I've talked with them in person. I gotten to know them and I trust them and I use them to help me manage my books. And I recommend that you do the same thing. And it's really cool because they also are offering a 30 day free trial. If you want to check it out, if you're doing your books by hand, like I was in the beginning, you're eventually going to get to a point where you're going to need some software to automate things and to make it easier, especially come tax season. I mean, it's February now. Tax season's right around the corner, uh, or actually right now for a lot of people. And so it just makes it push button easy to get those reports, those profit loss statements, the balance sheets, and everything you need to make your taxes easier and just just know what's going on in your business. So if you want to check out this 30-day free trial from FreshBooks, go to getfreshbooks.com and enter SPI in the checkout area. So again, that's getfreshbooks.com, enter SPI when uh, they ask you how you heard about, how you heard about it. Again, getfreshbooks.com, enter SPI. I hope you've been enjoying the free podcast content here. I'm really excited because it's one of my favorite things to do, and I know a lot of you have already taken action from the content that you've listened to on the podcast. And if that's you, congratulations. Just keep going, please. It's one of my favorite things to see. But I also know a lot of you, and a lot of you have been telling me that you've been wanting more. You've been wanting additional information, some accountability, some hand-holding along the way. And so depending on what it is that you're looking for, what I would recommend is actually go to smartpassiveincome.com slash courses. You'll see the courses that I'm offering there that are paid courses, but they're there to help walk you through certain processes. Depending on what problem you have or what issue or what thing you're trying to solve, go there, check it out. You can see if there's a course available for you and where you're at in your business right now, whether you're just getting started and and you just want to make sure you have all the right things in place before you actually devote a lot of time and effort into something, there's a course for you there. For those of you looking to get started with a podcast, there's stuff for you there. And there's going to be more courses there in the future. And how do I come up with those ideas for the courses? They come directly from you. So thank you for all telling me how I can help you better. And if you have ideas for more courses that I can create for you, just hit me up on Twitter at Pat Flynn. Let me know or uh, use my contact page on smartpassiveincome.com. But again, check out and see what's available, smartpassiveincome.com slash courses. That will be continually added to over time. So check it out. Thanks so much. I want to thank you again so much for listening in. I appreciate you. Again, the show notes are available at smartpassiveincome.com slash session 200. And here's to the next 200 episodes. I hope you'll be there with me too. I've got some great stuff coming up, including some more success stories, some more consultation call, coaching calls. You're going to be able to sit inside of some of those and a lot more great content coming your way too. Again, if you want to check out my new book, Will It Fly, head on over to willitflybook.com. It's going very well right now. I want to thank all of you who have gotten it so far and uh, I appreciate you and your support and love. I love you guys too. Cheers, take care, and I'll see you the next episode. Bye now. Thanks for listening to the Smart Passive Income Podcast at www.smartpassiveincome.com. Starting a business can feel daunting and confusing, but it doesn't have to be. That's why Terry Rice started the Launch Your Business Podcast, another awesome show from the Entrepreneur Podcast Network. Each week, Terry shares strategic actions, specific tools, and what he refers to as high-performance mindsets that allow you to thrive under pressure. Recent guests include rapper T.I., Amy Porterfield, and yours truly. And Terry frequently publishes value-packed solo shows too, like this one titled How to Write Proposals That Get Accepted and Don't Take Forever to Write. Great stuff. So make sure you listen in to launch your business right now on Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, or Stitcher.